Shalom. Um, so we're after Purim, and we've done a few sessions about Purim, preparing ourselves mentally, and now it's over. What happens after Purim? Pesach. We have, um, now we're in the, the, the time where we prepare for Pesach. We take the, the custom of 30 days of studying the laws of Pesach before Pesach. Um, but even more specifically, where are we at at the moment in terms of the Jewish calendar? There's a tradition of reading a, a part of the Torah um, on the week after Pesach, sorry, on the week after Purim, um, called Parashat Para, the, the reading of the red cow, the red heifer. And it's a very strange, weird, mm, intriguing reading. We'll look at that in a minute. Um, but before we look at the actual contents of the para reading, I want to share with you a text of Rabbi Nachman that talks about this journey of um, coming from Purim to Pesach through this para ritual. And what he does is he starts playing with the word para, cow, and pur, which is the lot uh, where Haman randomly chose the, the date of what became known as Purim. Okay, he chose the date of uh, when he wanted to kill all the Jews, and, uh, and then that became a, a, a festivity in the end when everyone was saved. Um, let's read this. This is from Likutei Moharan. And it's a very, uh, very strange Torah, very strange uh, teaching of Rabbi Nachman, because all, all teachings of Rabbi Nachman are, are cryptic and not so understandable necessarily, and he jumps from one thing to another. But here, Rabbi Nachman uh, stops a few times, and he actually stops in the middle of a sentence. Okay, so we'll get there. Achar Purim Korim Parashat Para. After Purim, we read the portion called Para, which is a preparation for Pesach. For we read Para in order to be careful with regards to purification from the highest impurity, in order to be pure for Pesach. And in the beginning, it has the aspect of pur, a random lot, a lottery. And Purim is also named after the pur. Afterwards, it is read as para, the same word with a, in the feminine. Since Purim is certainly on the way to Pesach. Okay, and interesting here, not just the connection of Purim and Pesach, We've spoken about that before. Purim happened on Pesach. Uh, like the, the, the date when Haman chose the, the date um, from the lottery, that was the 13th of Nisan, and they fasted for three days, and that was the days of Pesach. Um, but here Rabbi Nachman is saying there's not just a connection between the two of them, but there's a direction. Move from Purim to Pesach. For Purim is on the way to Pesach, he says, so that they could be careful with regards to Chametz. Stop. And then the, the editor, Rabbi Natan, puts in a little note here. Here, Rabbi Nachman paused in the middle of the issue and did not reveal more. And then we have here another attempt of Rabbi Nachman. This was a, like he gave it orally and it was written down afterwards, after Shabbat by Rabbi Nachman. So Rabbi Nachman tries to explain one more time what he wants to say. And he says, For in the beginning, all the beginnings began at Pesach. And therefore the mitzvot are all in memory of the exodus from Egypt. But now, and he never finished his sentence. And this is a great uh, Torah, there's a great teaching here. That he, he's, he's juxtaposing Pesach and Purim, right? Pesach has a beginning. In the beginning, all the beginnings began at Pesach. Pesach has a story, a narrative. A narrative has a beginning, a middle, and an end. We have the story, we have the Haggadah, we have the, 
the whole journey coming out of Egypt, which became the formation of the identity of the Jewish people, that's what it means to have a, a narrative. That's what it means to have a beginning. That's Pesach consciousness. It's a, it's a world that makes sense because it has a guiding narrative. But now, and he doesn't finish the sentence. Rabbi Nachman says, but now, and doesn't finish the sentence. What does he mean by, but now? And I heard in the name of Rav Fuhrman uh, that there's two ways of understanding this. Either there's a great secret about Purim, but he doesn't want to reveal it to us. He just tells us about Pesach, which can be talked about. And he doesn't tell us the deep secret of Purim, which he doesn't talk about. Or that, but now, Ve'achshav, but now, that is the secret of Purim. That's Purim consciousness. Purim consciousness is not to have a guiding narrative. It's not to have a world that makes sense. Right? In most of our life, we're more inclined to be in Pesach consciousness. But once a year, we touch this Purim consciousness. And maybe it ripples out. Okay? And the, the connection between Purim and Pesach consciousnesses is the reading of Para, the red cow. And I don't want to get into it too much, but there's a very strange ritual uh, of uh, um, they would in the temple times, they would burn a red cow and mix the ashes in water and sprinkle the water on impure people, and they would become pure, but the person sprinkling the water would become impure, and the same water would make someone pure and someone impure. It's very, very uh, cryptic. Um, and there's lots of story. This is like the, the paradigmatic uh, Jewish law that makes no sense, right? And uh, there's lots of writing about this as kind of the paradigm. Rashi says, this is, uh, this is the law that Satan comes to the Jewish people and taunts them with and says, what? What are you doing this for, right? Um, and we know that. We know there's lots of examples of uh, when, when stuff that we hold to be true is scrutinized from the outside and, and Satan or parts of ourself which, which ask satanic questions. Um, when we're asked, why do you do that? If we go to a place of reason, we end up sounding silly, right? We start saying, Oh, we keep uh, kosher because uh, it's really healthy. Uh, well, so just stay healthy. Don't keep kosher. Or uh, circumcision is uh, really great. Um, well, so just do great things. Just do healthy things. But all those reasons can be part of an answer, but they can never get to the answer because at the end of the day, the, the most important things for us are, are chukim. They're, they're commands which aren't based on reason. Right? They transcend reason. Um, there's another story, and if you're reading the texts, you can look into the beginning, but it's basically uh, this kind of pagan um, non-Jew comes to Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai and asks him uh, questions about like the magic of uh, the red cow ritual. And Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai gives him a, gives him an answer which uh, says, "Oh, we're, we're doing the same things that you are doing. Okay, you do all these rituals in order to cure um, evil spirits, and we do these rituals in order to cure impurity." If the story ended there, it would be very disappointing. But what's interesting about this story is that after Rabbi Yochanan gives this very weak answer to the to the pagan uh, the students of Rabbi Yochanan ben Zakkai come to him and says they say you pushed him off with a reed but what will you say to us right <laughs> they're saying basically that was bullshit right uh, all the stuff about magic why do we really have this red cow ritual what's the real answer tell us the like, the truth and he says to them, actually, 
A dead person doesn't make things impure. And the water doesn't make things pure. Rather, God said, I have engraved a rule and I have decreed a decree. And you have no permission to transgress what I decreed. This is the chok of the Torah. Um, and he's moving here, he's saying, yeah, there's like a level where I can talk about the reason of things, and maybe that's satisfying for some people. But when you're coming and asking uh, what goes beyond the satisfaction, yeah, if you want the real reason, then the real reason will never satisfy you. Right? There's, a, there's an experience of things which goes beyond reason. Um, and I, I am reminded of um, uh, Chacham Yosef Faul, who talks about um, Homo Mysticus, right? The mystical man that Maimonides is pushing us to become, the perfect version of ourselves. And Yosef Faul coins this wonderful um, phrase for the perfect person. And the perfect person, or the prophet, the best version of ourselves. He calls him the post-rational individual. The post-rational individual is someone who has mastered imagination and mastered reason and then transcends that and moves towards prophecy. And he's saying it's not that imagination is bad. It's not that having uh, uh, magical uh, reasons for things is bad. It's, a, it's something that has to be mastered to be able to tell those stories. But that's not it. And it's not that reason is bad. You know, we don't have to be irrational. But that's not it either. You have to master reason and transcend it to maybe to something like a Purim consciousness of being able to and not finish the sentence, but now, and comprehend the now in a, in a total way that isn't reduced to, um, to systems. That's not the way we usually live most of our life. Most of our life is Pesach consciousness of systems and narratives and beginnings and middles and ends. Um, but every now and again, and this is maybe what Purim inspires in us, is that we can reach these Purim moments all year round. Um, we can master imagination and reason. And we can be post-rational as well. I hope that gave you a few thoughts, and we're going to try and touch on other aspects of Pesach, and Pesach preparation, and life preparation, and life confusion uh, in the next few weeks. And now, 